Over 10 years after the first human invasion on Pandora, chief of the Omatakaya clan Jake lives happily at peace with his wife Neytiri and their kids. Neteim, Lok, and Tuk are their biological children, but they've also adopted two. There's Kiri, who was born from Grace's comatose avatar, and Spider, a human boy. Spider had been born on the human military base during the invasion and cryostasis hadn't been an option for a baby, so he couldn't be taken back to Earth with the others. Because he was raised by Jake and his family, Spider considers himself more Navi than human, but Neytiri is still wary of him because he's the son of the enemy. One evening, the family looks up to the sky and is devastated to discover that humans are returning to their planet, destroying everything on their path as if they hadn't learned their lesson. One year later, in one of the many human spaceships that are orbiting the planet, the army is transforming their soldiers' minds into newly hatched Avatar bodies. One of them doesn't take his awakening well until he's explained what's going on, it's Colonel Quaritch, who died during the first invasion. New Quaritch watches a tape left by himself explaining they copied his memories into the system so he could be cloned after death, and now his mission is to get revenge on Jake for defeating them last time. Meanwhile Jake and his clan warriors have organized a guerrilla operation to keep the humans from going far with their plans, mostly by attacking their supply lines. Most of them use traditional weapons and ride on mountain banshees, but as a former human, Jake still likes to take guns for his personal use and has adapted human communicators to be used among his family. During another very successful raid against the humans, Lok gets too cocky and disobeys Neteim, jumping into battle to help his dad in order to prove himself. Neteim goes after him, and this reckless action causes both kids to end up under fire when a human ship fights back. Lok jumps out of way just in time, but Neteim gets hurt and Jake has to rescue him from a pile of debris. When they return home, Jake scolds his sons for their actions and grounds them. Neytiri tries to remind her husband not to be so hard on them because they're kids, but Jake is afraid of losing them, so he needs to be strict to keep them safe. Sometime later, the siblings go visit Max, one of the few human scientists that betrayed the military and joined the Pandora defense team. He and his buddies have a small lab where they keep Grace's comatose body, and Kiri likes visiting her, she also likes to watch her video logs of when she was still in a human body. Kiri's siblings tease her for not knowing who her dad is, but Spider thinks maybe not knowing is for the best, because he hates the fact he's a spawn of the enemy. In the meantime, Quaritch and his team of avatars land on the new human base in Pandora, where they learn that, thanks to their new advances in technology, humans are settling down at triple the speed compared to a decade ago. Once they get properly armed, the team goes to explore the forest, where they find machine parts left from the last invasion, and Quaritch is shocked to see the reminders of his previous body. At the same time, all of Jake's kids except for Neteim are in the area having some fun, but they immediately hide behind the plants when they see the enemy arrive. Lok lets his father know through the communicator and receives orders to leave quietly, but as soon as the siblings try to move, they're ambushed by Quaritch and his team. Quaritch immediately can tell these are Jake's kids because their fingers mark them as half-breed, but the biggest surprise is to see Spider, who turns out to be Quaritch's son. Since Quaritch and his team now have to wait to be picked up, this gives Jake and Neytiri the chance to approach them in the darkness after telling Neteim not to interfere. Neytiri makes an animal-like sound to alert the children of her presence before she and Jake's begin killing soldiers from the shadows, and the kids know to immediately bite their captors and run away. Quaritch recognizes Neytiri's arrows and taunts her to get her location, but Neteim decides to join the fight just in time to save his mother. At that moment, a human ship arrives to pick up Quaritch's team, so Neytiri concentrates on reuniting with her children, not even thinking about finding Spider as well. This allows Quaritch to take the boy with him when he escapes. At the human base, Spider is put on an interrogation machine, but he withstands the pain and doesn't say a word. Quaritch tries the gentle approach instead, telling the kid he may have Quaritch's memories but he's a different person that would love to bond with his son, effectively convincing Spider he may not be that bad after all. When the family returns home, Jake tells Neytiri they should go away. Neytiri refuses to leave her people behind, but Jake explains Quaritch wants specifically them, so it'll be safer for the clan without their presence. After Jake chooses a successor, the clan goes through the traditional ritual to pass off the chief mantle, and the family gets to leave for the Mitkaina coast. Here, the local clans have adapted to the aquatic habitat and can stay longer underwater without breathing. When the family arrives, Chief Tanoari and his wife Ronal are wary of them because of their human blood and the possibility of the war following them here, but Jake swears they weren't followed, and since tradition demands shelter to be given to anyone in need, the family gets to stay. Tanoari asks his children to act as guides, and while his son Onung wants nothing to do with them, his daughter Rhea gladly shows them around. From then on, Jake's family works hard to adapt to the reef life, learning things like riding aquatic creatures called alu and tricks to teach their bodies to be underwater for longer periods of time. It takes them a few tries to get it right, but to everyone's surprise, Kiri doesn't need to learn any extra tricks, she naturally can stay underwater all she wants and she instantly develops a bond with all the creatures of the sea. Meanwhile Quaritch's team begins taking Spider on their exploring missions, assigning him as their official interpreter. Spider also takes them to a nest of icrons, dangerous flying creatures that can't be tamed by just anyone. Quaritch gives it a try anyway, 
confronting the creature to prove himself in combat and accidentally causing them both to fall off the cliff. The team thinks Quaritch is dead and they're ready to return to base, but at the moment, Quaritch makes a triumphant return by riding the tamed Ikrin. Back on the reef, Kiri continues to bond with the sea, prompting A. Anung and his friends to make fun of her for being a weirdo. Loke comes to her defense and Neteum quickly follows him to try to keep things diplomatic, but Loke is too hot-headed and starts a fight anyway, so Neteum has no choice but to help. When the adults finally come to pull them apart, Jake scolds his sons for their actions. He's frustrated by the constant teasing as well, but they have to endure it because they're guests here and they can't afford to be kicked out. Neytiri tries to comfort Kiri, who is upset over the fact she's different even biologically, as proven by a section of her face that she keeps hidden under her hair. Afterward, Loke follows his father's orders and apologizes to A. Nung and his friends for the fight. A. Nung accepts the apology and takes Loke to a special remote area to teach him how to fish underwater, but while Loke is concentrating on his prey, A. Nung and his friends leave because this had been a prank all along. Now Loke's stranded and has to figure out how to come back, but his thoughts are suddenly interrupted when he's hit by a giant sea predator. Loke quickly goes underwater to swim away and hide under the coral, but soon he begins running out of air and has to come out. The predator comes after him as soon as it sees him but suddenly, a bigger whale-like creature called a tulkun shows up to defeat the predator right as Loke passes out. Seconds later, Loke wakes up on top of the tulkun, who has saved him from drowning. Loke befriends the tulkun and as thanks for the help, he removes a harpoon from its fin left by human whalers. Then the tulkun guides Loke back to the village, although it leaves before it can be seen. Loke reunites with his family and Tanoari tries to apologize for his son, but Loke lies and says it was all his idea. This gets him scolded by Jake again, who calls him the shame of the family. Afterward, Aonung wonders why Loke lied for him, and Loke explains he knows how much it hurts to disappoint your dad. The next day, Loke tells everyone about his adventure, and the locals realize that Loke met Paikin, a tulkun that went rogue. Everyone thinks it's a killer, and they won't listen to Loke when he says Paikin's actually nice. A few hours later, Loke goes looking for Paikin and asks why it was made an outcast by its own family, but Paikin refuses to explain. While they swim together as friends, Rhea takes Kiri to their clan's tree of souls in order to connect her mind to it and meet Grace's spirit. After a warm hug, Kiri asks why she's different and who her father is, but before Grace can answer, the connection is lost because Kiri suddenly has a seizure. Her siblings take her back to the village and Jake calls Max so his team can take a look at her, but then one that brings her back to consciousness is Ronal thanks to the use of a traditional medicinal ritual. Max and his doctor friend explain to Jake that Kiri had an epileptic attack and she shouldn't connect to the tree ever again. Since Max used his own ship to reach Jake, the signal was picked up by the human base. They lost it when the ship went further into the sea, and to find it again they'll need someone that knows the area and can help them visit hundreds of islands. Quaritch takes his team to negotiate with a whaler ship, and when the whalers refuse to help, Quaritch forces them to collaborate by threatening them with death. While a pot of tulkuns makes their annual visit to Tanoari's village, Quaritch and his men reach the first island and capture the locals to demand information on Jake. Spider finally gets to see how ruthless Quaritch is when interrogation turns violent and the boy has to stop his father from killing everyone just because they don't know anything. Unfortunately Quaritch still orders his men to burn all the houses. The news of Quaritch arriving at the island soon reaches Tanoari, who warns Jake he's being chased after all. Neytiri wants to go after Quaritch to end things once and for all, but Jake asks her to be patient and make a proper plan. In the meantime, Loke goes to visit Paikin while his friends watch from the shadows to see if he's telling the truth. Loke wants to know why Paikin is an outcast, so the creature opens its mouth and Loke swims inside to connect his mind to Paikin's. This allows him to see the whole story. It turns out Paikin's mother was attacked by whalers and Paikin fought back to defend her, but its pod still kicked Paikin out because they're supposed to be a peaceful species and violence went against their beliefs. When the kids return to the village, Tanoari and Ronal furiously scold them for disrespecting Tulkun's culture. At the end of the day, only Rhea supports Loke and expresses how proud she is of him. Sometime later, Quaritch realizes that violence won't make the villagers speak, so he agrees to help the whalers hunt the Tulkuns, knowing that killing the creatures the locals consider their brothers will draw Jake out of hiding. Now Spider has to watch in disgust how the whalers send up ships to kill the Tulkuns with specialized weapons that can track the creatures' noises. To make matters worse, the only reason they hunt Tulkuns is to extract their brain enzymes in order to use them in anti-aging remedies, and the rest of the creature is wasted. The whalers throw the bodies back into the ocean and when the villagers find them, they immediately blame Jake and his family for it. They want to go out and fight back, but Jake presents them the tracker he found on a tulkun fin and explains as a trap, so for now, they need to stay put and simply tell the tulkun to swim away for safety. Loke realizes that nobody will warn Paikin because it's an outcast and he goes to do it himself, ignoring the warnings from his brother. Neteim takes his sisters, Aonung, and Rhea with him to follow Loke, and they find him trying to remove a tracker from Paikin's fin. The group jumps in to help, but it's too late, the tracker has already sent their location to the whaler ship and it's coming for them. The siblings use their communicators to tell Jake of the incoming danger, 
and Jake alerts the whole village, who immediately grabs their weapons and jumps on their illus to join the fight. The kids manage to remove the tracker and swim away with it to get the attention off Paikin, but this is exactly what Quaritch wanted and he sends his men after them. A rather long chase begins underwater, and since the kids need to stop to breathe, it gives time for the humans to catch up to Loke, Tuke, and Rhea, and they capture them with a net. As soon as Spider sees his siblings being brought abroad, he tries to fight to rescue them, but he's quickly overpowered by the humans and sent back inside while the kids are to tie the railing. At that moment, Jake and the rest of the villagers show up, but they quickly stop themselves from attacking when they realize their kids are hostages. Quaritch takes Loke's communicator and asks Jake to come alone if he doesn't want to lose his kids, but as Jake begins to come closer, suddenly Paikin shows up and jumps over the ship to land on top of it, destroying it with its fins and tail. It also keeps pushing away the soldiers because the bullets do nothing to it. Now the humans are distracted away from the kids, Jake calls the others to attack the ship, and the whalers turn around their boats to attack Paikin with harpoons, causing it to return to the water. A fierce battle begins between Navi and humans, and the Navi quickly gain an advantage thanks to their creatures being able to move faster in the sky and hide underwater. Kiri uses her bond with the sea life to send the plants after the submarines, and when the main ship begins catching fire after a boat crashes against it, Spider takes advantage of his position inside to activate the fans and spread the fire all over the vessel, he also begins to destroy the control panel. The ship eventually comes to a stop and begins filling with water. Meanwhile Jake is going one-on-one -on -one against Quaritch. At first they use their weapons, but Jake runs out of bullets and sends his Ikrin to attack Quaritch's, which causes both of them to fall into the sea. The whalers go after Paikin, shooting a harpoon with a steel rope at its end, but Paikin does another jump and uses that same rope to destroy the boat. At the main ship, Neteum finally manages to come aboard and free his people. The girls jump into the water but Loke wants to rescue Spider, so Neteum has to stay to help his brother. At that moment, one of the soldiers captures Kiri and brings her to the ship to tie her up as well. Thus Tuke convinces Rhea to return to rescue her. As soon as they reach the ship though, Quaritch shows up, pushes Rhea back into the water, and captures Tuke as well. The humans are already leaving the sinking ship, meaning it's easy for Loke and Neteum to sneak around and attack them by surprise. As soon as Spider sees them he joins the fight and reunites with his brothers, but soon they have to run because more soldiers show up, opening fire on them. Neteum makes his brothers jump into the water while he holds the soldiers back with his own weapon, this allows for Rhea to show up in her aloo and offer a ride. They wait for Neteum to join them, but when their brother finally jumps into the water too, it's revealed that he got wounded by a bullet. The group immediately takes him to a small island so Jake and Neytiri can look at him, but unfortunately, Neteum dies in their arms. At that moment, Quaritch contacts Jake to tell him he has his daughters and once again asks him to come alone. Jake sends Neytiri away on her banshee as backup, then returns to the ship with Spider as his guide. Loke is supposed to stay behind, but once again he disobeys orders and goes back to the ship too. The soldiers are in position waiting for Jake at the front, but Spider shows Jake how to sneak inside unseen, giving him the chance to throw a grenade and start a fire. Chaos and confusion follow the explosion, and this is used by Jake and Neytiri to jump in and begin killing soldiers all over the place. Neytiri is in berserker mode because of her grief, and it makes Spider too scared to approach her since he looks like the enemy. Jake manages to reach Tuke and free her, but Kiri is missing, it turns out Quaritch saw him coming and grabbed Kiri to use as a hostage. This makes Jake drop his weapons and Spider come out of hiding to beg for Kiri's life, prompting Neytiri to jump in as well to grab Spider as her own hostage. She wants to trade a child for a child, and when Quaritch at first says he doesn't care, Neytiri hurts Spider to prove she means it, causing Quaritch to release Kiri to save his son. Neytiri immediately takes all her children to the water to escape, but Jake decides to stay behind to fight Quaritch, otherwise he will return with backup. While the men get into a fierce hand-to-hand -hand battle, the sinking ship goes so deep that it begins turning around and traps Jake, Quaritch, Neytiri, and Tuke inside. Kiri and Spider manage to stay out, and when Loke shows up looking for his family, the three of them split to cover more ground. Kiri uses her bond with the sea creatures to use as guides to find Neytiri and Tuke, and these very same creatures are the ones to escort them out of the ship. Meanwhile Jake finally puts Quaritch in a dangerous hold and finishes him, leaving the body to sink into the sea. After fighting so long underwater he's out of air, but Loke finds him and guides him to a room with some sass to breathe as he reminds him of Rhea's breathing exercises. Spider is also searching and comes across Quaritch, who isn't dead, just unconscious. After lots of internal struggling, Spider decides he can't leave him there and drags his father back to the surface. Paikin also makes a return to rescue Loke and Jake, this act of heroism finally makes Jake tell Loke he's proud of him. While the two of them reunite with Neytiri and the girls, Spider leaves Quaritch on an island and watches his Ikrin come to the rescue. When Quaritch wakes up, he tries to make Spider escape with him, but Spider ignores him and jumps back into the water to reunite his family. Sometime later, the family gives Neteum a burial following the traditions of Tanoari's clan. Once the ritual has been properly finished and Neteum is one with nature, 
Jake and Neytiri connect their minds to the Tree of Souls, this way they get to visit Neteum Soul one last time. Make sure to subscribe and turn on notifications so you can watch more videos like this. Thanks for watching.